All right, welcome to CS um, uh, 4510. This is uh, the Cook-Levin theorem. The Cook-Levin theorem uh, is like one of the 16a, I think. The Cook-Levin theorem is one of the theorems of all time. It is like such a great and fantastic theorem. But I'll tell you that the details in the theorem, I mean, conceptually, it's kind of simple. But the details in this theorem are really kind of a little, are very, it's very detail-oriented. Um, recall, like in uh, 3510, we talked a lot about NP-completeness, right? We talked about it maybe for four or five lectures, depending on who you had it with. But uh, a polytime reduction is like, um, if A and B are two languages uh, in sigma star, we say that A is polytime reducible to B uh, if uh, uh, there exists um, F is computable in polytime and uh, W is in A if and only if F of W is in B. And equivalently, uh, W is not an A if and only if f of w is not in b. So a polytime reduction in contrast to a mapping reduction or a many-one reduction that we've done before is a relationship between, is a correctness relationship between two languages. But instead of simply being a correctness relationship between the two languages, it's a correctness relationship such that the relationship is also computable in polynomial time. Right? So NP-completeness is this theory of, like, Complexity theorists, theorists in general, totally fail to prove lower bounds on algorithms, right? We have no idea how to prove a certain problem is hard. Given, we have like two problems that we can prove, I know of, that we can prove, prove unconditionally do not have polynomial time algorithms. Um, chess, generalized chess, is XP time complete. And under uh, what's called the time hierarchy theorem, we know that's, that cannot be in P. Uh, Equivalence of regular expressions with squaring turns out is also XP space, and therefore not in P. None of those problems are known to be in P. Uh, excuse me, not, none of those are known. None of those are thought to be or known to be in NP. So we really have no problems. I mean, we would love to know lower bounds on problems like this requires some super polynomial amount of steps, but we can't actually prove anything to be hard. We don't know how to prove anything to be hard. It was a great failure in the 60s and 70s, people trying really hard to show certain problems were intractable, that you couldn't solve certain problems with certain resource. Instead, we got the theory of NP completeness, which basically says, uh, if P does not equal NP, uh, then NP complete problems are hard. We'll talk about in more detail what that means, but basically this is a conditional hardness. It's good enough. One of the reasons it's so P versus NP is such an important result is because we have thousands and thousands of these great problems, but we can't prove any of them to require a certain number of steps to compute. But we can say if we assume P does not equal NP, then they're all hard. That's fine. But we can't we can't make that, we can't say they're hard unless that's true. So we're so certain it's true, but we can't prove it. It is conditional theory of hardness. Let me give you uh, a cartoon explanation. Let's see if this works. Um, this one? OK. I'm going to give you a cartoon explanation about why uh, um, NP completeness exists, right? So like, you want to prove this is. So the Gary and Johnson book is this famous book from like 1979. It proves, it's famous because the last third of the book is simply an appendix of 10,000 NP-complete problems or something, right? There's so many problems across many diverse areas. This is a cartoon that tries to explain NP-completeness, like the point of it in the, in the beginning. And so you, and Gary and Johnson worked in industry. They worked at Bell Labs during the, like these golden age years in the 60s and 70s. You go to your, your boss gives you a problem, you know, you want to optimize the number of wire or something, you know, whatever problems that a communication firm has to solve. Your boss gives you a problem. He says, you know, do the price market auctioning of these Bandersnatch items, whatever, you know, knapsack, something like this. You try to find an efficient algorithm to this problem, you can't do it. So you go to your boss and you say, I can't find an efficient algorithm. I guess I'm just too dumb. 
And that's not a very good thing to do. Because if you fail to find an efficient algorithm for a problem, that doesn't mean that there isn't one. It just means maybe you weren't good enough to find that algorithm. You know, Trying and failing, not being able to prove something doesn't mean that it's unprovable, necessarily. It just means that you maybe you weren't good enough. You don't want to do this, though, because that'll jeopardize your job. So what you do instead is, where's my mouse? Where's the mouse? OK. Um, so instead, maybe you try to prove the problem is what's called intractable. Intractability means hardness, basically. A problem is intractable if it's hard. A problem is tractable intuitively it's e if it's easy under whatever model of computation we're using. So you try to prove the problem is intractable. And you stride confidently into his office, and you, and you say, I can't find an efficient algorithm because no such algorithm is possible. Such, uh, how could this work? You could prove, for example, the problem requires an exponential number of steps. And we did mention two problems where that's the case. You could prove the problem is unsolvable. You could prove, perhaps with reduction or diagonalization or whatever method, that the problem is uh, undecidable. It gives you a specific problem. And he asks you to decide it. And if given an algorithm for it, you say, no, I can't do it. It's undecidable. This never happens in practice. Like, uh, undecidable problems rare, rarely appear in this way. They're usually pretty contrived. Now, you, proving either the problem to be undecidable is rare, but proving an exponential lower bound on a problem is also almost impossible. I mean, no one has ever done it. Instead, what you can do is. You can go to his office and you say, I can't find an efficient algorithm, but can neither of all of these famous people. What you could do is by proving the problem to be NP-complete, you elevate it to a special class. It gets a little sticker. And basically, every NP-complete problem is in a suicide pact with all the other NP-complete problems that say, if you were able to solve any of us, you could solve all of us, and you would also win a million dollars by proving P does not equal NP, something like this. Or, excuse me, if you could find a polynomial time algorithm for any problem, you could prove P equals NP. If you could prove an any super polynomial lower bound on any NP-complete pr problem, you could prove P does not equal NP, and so on. It's quite literally a suicide pact. And that's pretty convincing. You know, I'll tell you a story. I uh, was working on a problem in, it doesn't really matter now, but it was like qu you have quantum circuits and you want to compile them to work on the weird IBM quantum architecture thing they got going on. So you have to somehow map this quantum circuit onto the machine, the physical machine, the logical qubits onto the real qubits. And basically, like, I was like, ah, this algorithm from this paper was really bad. It was really like, it was basically worse on certain inputs, a certain family of inputs, than randomly guessing. Like, a randomized algorithm was better. And I was like, I could probably do something better than that. So I go and I spend like two months, six weeks, I'm trying to find a better algorithm. I keep trying and I keep failing. Like, nothing I'm, nothing I'm able to come up with solves this problem. And then in like an hour and a half, I woke up from a nap and I was like, actually, maybe the problem's going to be complete. So you sit down, you prove it. And there you go. So I take that as evidence that I was not able to solve the problem because the problem was NP-complete. Great. Now, what happens after you prove a problem is NP-complete? There's two philosophies. Well, there's really one philosophy. And my philosophy is that you give up. If a problem is NP-complete, stop working on it because that means uh, you can't do it too well. You'll end up, uh, if you were to have any amountable measurable success in the problem, theoretically, you would prove P is equal to NP. So such a task is, of course, very hard. So you probably won't succeed. Uh, and I was telling this professor, I'm like, yeah, over coffee in the, like, the little break room, I was like, yeah, I love it when the problem's going to be complete, because then I can give up, and I can go do something else. And she was like, no, you can't do that. That's not how it works. Um, instead, what you have to do is you have to apply several coping mechanisms. Just because a problem is NP complete doesn't mean people give up solving it. Like, knapsack is NP complete, but what if, um, what if you are still you still need to solve it in a practical way for a business? You still want to find perhaps not the optimal solution, but a close solution or something like this, right? So what you do is you approximate the solution, or you like given a certain time bound, what's the best you can do? And then you just deal with that. You know, maybe maybe there's average case uh, things, you know. SMT solvers, even if SAT is such a hard problem, and we'll talk about SAT today, <coughs> SMT solvers seem to work practically. I mean, they you can of course construct inputs that they won't succeed on in your lifetime, but they work practically, so like, I mean, apply these coping unit mechanisms, they seem to work, you know? But this is the point of NP completeness, right? Um, let's talk about how this uh, suicide pact actually works, right? Do you recall how to prove a problem to be, uh, what is the definition of an NP complete problem? Do you guys remember? Let's say we want to prove uh, B is NP complete. What is the two steps we, uh, 
uh, you have to do? And? All problems reduced to B? Correct. If for all L, we'll say for all A in NP, that there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B. Now, this is always kind of hard to remember and keep track of, but here's the picture. Here's what you should do is think geometrically. Here we have P, and we're plotting hardness that way, if you could imagine we did such a thing. And then here's NP. Okay. When we are proving a problem to be NP complete, what that really means is it's one of the hardest problems in all of NP. It is in NP, but it's the hardest of the hardest problems in NP. If B is in NP, that means it's not too hard. It means it's not like super exponential or something weird. You know, if we could measure that in time, you can still verify solutions to the problem. So when we think of a problem being in NP, we think of when we prove that B is an NP, we're really bounding it between here, OK? It could be true that if you just prove B is an NP, it could be also true that B is in P. But we don't want to, that's not true when we do the second statement. To prove a problem, this is called NP hardness. To prove a problem is NP hard, you simply give a polynomial time reduction from all problems in NP, right? And I think it's improper to draw NP hardness as a class, but that's OK. Um, Here's what happens when you prove it's NP hard. By proving it's NP hard, you've proven that it's harder than all the problems in NP. By giving a polynomial time reduction from every NP complete problem, from, excuse me, from every problem, every language in NP to B, you've proven it's harder than the entire class of NP. So what this means is when you prove A is polynomial time reducible to B for all A in NP, you've proven it's harder than all of NP. So simultaneously, it's harder than all of NP, yet it's in NP. So what does that mean? It's here at the tip. It's at the limit. This little intersection here is the NP-complete problem, and this is where you put B. So that's where B goes as an NP-complete problem. Right? It is geometrically at the tip of NP. Right? You should think of this polynomial time reduction as like B is to the right of A. B is harder than A. That's what it means. Right? Questions on this picture? Well, we're not done talking about the, like, what does this mean? You know. Our conditional theory of hardness is basically like, if P does not equal NP and B is NP complete, that basically means that B is not NP. That's where the conditional uh, part comes from. Right? So if you recall, we don't actually use this definition of NP hardness, though, when we did it in 3510. We never actually said, like, for every single language in NP. Do you remember what we did instead of that? Also, NP hard. Yeah, instead of reducing from every single problem, we reduced from one known NP complete problem. And the reason that worked is because this reduction is transitive. A goes to B goes to C implies A goes to C. So the way we did it, at least the way I did it, is I go from SAT, and then from SAT I did 3 SAT, and then from 3 SAT we did all kinds of things. And we'll talk about these definitions again, but I'm just refreshing you if you took uh, this recently. From SAT we did independent set which was a graph problem. And then from independent set, we did clique, and we did vertex cover. Um, from 3SAT, we also did subset sum, and knapsack. From subset sum, we did knapsack. Both of these are constraint problems. Um, and then from 3SAT, we also did like circuit sat. So we did some. Logic problems with SAT, 3SAT, circuit SAT. There were some graph problems in there. Independent set, clique, vertex co cover. And then from 3SAT, we also did some constraint problems. We did SAT, SAT, NAT, SAC. Do you guys have a favorite NP complete problem? Not of this list, but maybe one you've seen in your own work in some way. No? Damn. Um, all kinds of things are NP complete, like in such, such surprising ways. I mentioned the quantum compilation problem. That's one. Um, another one could be like uh, um, like packing a Bitcoin block, like choosing transactions to fit into a Bitcoin block. Many networking problems are NP-complete. Uh, knapsack, of course, is NP-complete. Finding a clique or a vertex cover, Hamiltonian path, Hamiltonian cycle, traveling salesman, 
finding an optimal amount is NP-complete. Um, there are something like 6,000 new NP-complete problems in a year. That stat was discovered in the 90s. Somebody like tab tabulated like one year in the 90s, 6,000 new NP-complete problems were defined. So there's new NP-complete problems coming out all the time. It, the equivalence of, of, of two knots embedded in, in, uh, on a, uh, in the plane. Um, all kinds of combinatorial problems are NP-complete. And notice that basically all of this relies on one thing, though. Like, this is only true if SAT is NP-complete. So from SAT, we go all of NP. Now, we went from SAT to everything. And we go from all of NP to SAT. It's only true, this, all of this thing we did in 3510 only works out if we uh, went from all of NP to SAT. That is called the Cook-Levin theorem, and that's what we'll be proving today. The Cook-Levin theorem says that SAT is NP-complete. It is the genesis NP-complete problem. And once you have that SAT is NP-complete, you get the rest of the theory of NP-completeness, right? Uh, such a great, beautiful, wonderful theory, all these, all these interesting problems across many domains. If I could tell you some history of this problem, like uh, Cook, uh, there's some famous story about like, how he was working uh, with Hao Wang at Harvard, and then he like, did not get a job at Berkeley. He went to Toronto and immediately proved the Cook-Levin theorem, and then they, they like, regretted it for like 50 years. The Cook-Levin theorem just celebrated its 50th 53rd birthday, something like this. This was like 1971. Levin uh, was a young student of Kolmogorov in the Soviet Union across the Iron Curtain. He had, there's like no, not much communication. He had uh, worked with Kolmogorov and he was able to prove SAT is NP complete among many of the other combinatorial problems. And then something happened politically and he had to like escape. And so he was able to publish his result independently in 1973. He didn't actually prove SAT to be NP complete. He proved what's called a tiling problem. In fact, Cook didn't actually prove SAT. He proved the complement of SAT to be, I guess we would say co-NP complete now. But uh, they also gave various definitions of reductions. And then in like two years later, a guy named Karp came along. And Karp proved that there was 21 NP complete problems from across many domains. Mathematicians really didn't pay attention to computer science at this point. But they were very engrossed in graph problems like you know, how do we find an independent set? How do we find a subset sum? How do we find, you know, a clique of, of a graph? How do we decompose graphs? All these interesting combinatorial problems. And Karp was able to show that actually these problems are all the same. Up to polynomial cost, any algorithm for one is an algorithm for all. So this changed the whole mo motivation. Like a huge, I mean, you go to 21 different people's houses, 21 experts on 21 different problems, and you say, hey, uh, stop working. We all need to get together and work on this one thing now. Um, all these problems are the same as each other. You know, that's sort of the the history of uh, of this problem. Um, before we get to proving that uh, SAT is NP complete and what SAT is, I'm going to prove to you one quick little not lemma, but like app, uh, application of this, or like the reason we care, or like where where does this come from? Uh, if A is polynomial time reducible to B. What we mean by polynomial time reduction, again, is that there's a translation between A and B. And this translation not only is a correctness property, like the mapping reduction, but takes polynomial time to compute. So if you have the strings in A and the strings not in A, and the strings like in B and the strings not in B, then whatever uh, this mapping is, it just preserves the correctness. Good goes to good and bad goes to bad, right? It need not be bijective or surjective or anything like this, but um, everything good has to map to something good, and everything bad has to map to something bad. The reason we care about this is if A is polynomial time reducible to B, and uh, B is in P, what should that imply? A is in P. Yeah. If B is harder than A, and A is e and B is easy, that means A is easy. Here's the proof. Assume... Uh, that A is poly, poly time reducible to B, and uh, B is in P, uh, then there exists a decider in poly time, uh, a poly time decider 
for B, give me a letter. G. G, okay, well. Um, here's a, a polytime alg for A, and this will prove that A is in P. A is going to, this polytime alg for A is going to take on input W, and it's going to compute uh, F of W. That's going to take polynomial time because the, polyno the, re re the reduction takes polynomial time. Then it's going to say uh, if G of F of W, uh, accept. Else reject. Here's the way the polytime alg works. It's going to go here. It's going to compute the mapping. Then it's going to decide between if it's in B or not in B. That can occur in polynomial time. Computing the mapping takes polynomial time. Determining if B or not B takes polynomial time. So simply, if it's in B, return true. You could have to come from something good. If you return something, if, if the decider for B said bad, that means you were bad. So you know you're bad, right? What's the contrapositive of this? B and P implies A and P. If A is not in P, that implies B is not in P. So if sad is hard, the rest of the problems are hard. That's basically what goes on, right? Any questions on that? All right, let's get to the Cook-Levin theorem now. Let's get to the proof that sad is NP-complete. Before we even do that, we need to talk about what sad is. Part of the reason that this is not covered in 3510 and we just like assume SAT is NP-complete and keep going is that the Cook-11 theorem is pretty conceptually simple, but it's filled with kinds of lots of little details. It's got a lot of programming. Sometimes a proof is not proof, uh, a proof, it's a, it's a program. And that's basically all the Cook-11 does is do some programming. SAT is uh, defined as follows. Um, a variable is a letter like x1 to, let's say, xl, and these will take on Boolean values. A literal is a variable or negation. Right? A clause is an or of literals. And what's called CNF form, uh, conjunctive normal form, is an and of clauses. Right? So a clause is an or of literals, and a CNF is an and of clauses, right? You guys have probably seen this somewhere. You're probably maybe recalling this deep from your memory uh, of what CNF form is. Um, now, given a CNF, we, we, we denote a CNF by phi, right? Given a CNF, you can choose an assignment to the CNF, right? By choosing an assignment, what we mean is assign the variables x, y, z, whatever those variables are, to 0 and 1. And you compute using Boolean logic what the output of the formula is, right? You evaluate the CNF at some variables, and it's going to be a 1 or a 0, right? That's what we, we would say an assignment of uh, a formula is. SAT is a language of encodings of CNFs that have satisfiable assignments. So it is a logical formula of and, or, and not written in the specific CNF form such that there exists an assignment to the formula which is satisfying. You can choose x to be on, y to be off, so on, such that when you plug and chug, you will get, um, and you would get a 1 on the output, right? Um, CNFs are really powerful. Like, so many problems, so many problems that you would have no idea, that you would not think 
to, to be written as CNFs, can be written as CNFs, but a lot of them can be. A lot of times, constraint problems look like this. When you and a bunch of clauses together, what you're doing is you, you, you're saying all of these laws need to be satisfied, you know? But within each law, there may be more than one way to satisfy them, right? So, like, you need to, both of these to be on, but when you go inside each clause, there's more than one way to turn it on, right? And maybe turning some law on, satisfying a law some way, doesn't satisfy it another way, right? So a, lot, a surprising amount of things can be expressed, like a surprising amount of problems can be expressed as a CNF. Um, here's, let me give you a CNF and let me, tell me what solutions does this have. Suppose we have x1 or uh, not y1 and uh, not x1 or y1. Uh, and and uh, let's say xn or yn not, and uh, xn not or yn, right? So we have two n variables here uh, between x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. Suppose we have the CNF. What assignments satisfy the CNF? Give me an assi assignments that satisfy the CNF. L to the n, where L is either like 0, 1, or 1, 0. Like uh, x or y, like xi or yi is 1, and the other one is 0. Like they're mutually exclusive, and you pick for any of the other choices. The, they're mutually exclusive, but if x is, so suppose you say x1 is 0 and y1 is 1, yeah. then not y1 is 0, so the first clause is unsatisfied. So true. Yeah. All 1s or all 0s? All 1s would work. You put a 1 here. One here, one here, one here works. Okay. There's more solutions though. What are some more solutions to this one? All zeros is also another solution, but there's more. Exactly what solutions are there? Yeah. It's just matching pairs. Yeah. So in fact, what we could say is like if x is equal to x1 to xn and y is equal to y y1 to yn, that this phi is in sat, uh, well, it is satisfiable, but phi of, let's say, x, uh, y is equal to 1 if and only if x equals y. This is a CNF for string equality. We were able to represent the equality operation, which has nothing to do with this, with ands, ors, and nots, right? As a computer scientist, you probably are pretty familiar with Boolean circuits, like, doing everything for you. But CNFs are slightly different than Boolean circuits. They're, they're like a formula for solve. It's not a circuit. It's a formula. And that's already different than a circuit. Um, but uh, it's written in a specific way as well. There's just one ands at the top, so to speak, right? And everything else is ORed inside. CNFs, though, still surprisingly expressive. Very powerful thing. Questions on this, on the CNF? All right, we see CNFs are pretty powerful. Uh, let's prove the Cook-Levin theorem, okay? Let me give you an outline of the proof before we get into the, to the details. So we want to prove um, uh, that for all L in NP, that there's a polynomial <laughs> time reduction from L to sat. That's what we want to show. Right? We want to prove that all problems in NP can be reduced to SAD in polynomial time. But this is tricky because unlike doing a single reduction, we have to do it for every problem in NP, right? every single one. So we're already at a wall with this. And by the way, just in, it, theory of NP completion should be surprising, perhaps, because NP is a class of many, many problems. SAD is one problem. What the statement really says is that one problem is somehow a representative of all the problems. All the problems are simply sat. That's sort of going to motivate what our proof is going to look like. Um, we need some way to convert something into formulas that are satisfiable if and only if. Uh, so we somehow need w to be in L if and only if f of w is in sat, and f of w should output a formula. How are we going to do this? Well, we know what do we know about f of w? We know that W is an L, if and only if. What is the definition of NP? It's like a, a witness that can then be verified along with W. 
You can actually prove Cook-Levin using the witness definition or the non-deterministic definition. Only because I already memorized it using the non-deterministic definition, I'm going to go that way. But know that the proof is identical if you use the verifiable definition. Uh, if there exists a non-deterministic machine, n on w accepts. OK? Now, an n is a non-deterministic polynomial time machine. n is an NTM which runs in polytime. So what we can do is actually convert. Uh, we're not going to convert the language into a, a, a thing. What we're going to actually do is create a formula to simulate the machine in some sense. That is going to be sort of interesting. What we're going to do is our reduction is actually going to take on n, comma w. And it's going to output um, a formula of n and hard coded with n and w that takes on some variables x, right? Such that um, if uh, n on w accepts, uh, that's going to be true if and only if uh, this this hard coded formula n comma w of variables x is in SAT. That's sort of how our reduction is going to work, okay? Now, n and w are, I mean, you don't know if n accepts w immediately. We're, we have only a polytime reduction. We're going to simply take the description of the machine, the description of the word, and write down a formula phi in polynomial time. But how are we going to know if n accepts w or not? We, again, we can't. A reduction should not solve the problem. Because if you could solve the problem, that would make everything kind of trivial. It sort of translates problems that you don't think solutions are easily found for. So we don't know if n accepts w or not, but we do know if it does accept w, we'll create a formula to be satisfiable. And if it doesn't accept w, we'll create a formula to make sure it's not satisfiable. What are the inputs, which, what are the inputs to the formula going to look like? They're going to be a bunch of Boolean variables, but they'll encode something with semantic meaning. Computation. It's going to be the computation history. It's, n is going to accept w. There's going to be a sequence of configurations of the machine, snapshots of the machine. x is going to correspond to an encoding of those snapshots. So if someone says, I know n accepts w, here's the proof, here's the description of the machine, you can plug those into that, and that would actually correspond exactly to the satisfying assignment. So uh, there's many kinds of definitions of reductions. The, there's a Carp reduction. There's a Cook reduction. There's a Levin reduction. There's even parsimonious reduction. I, you know, there was this book I was reading. It didn't define any of the reductions it was using, except in the appendix. It was very confusing. The book is actually great, but it was kind of troublesome. The appendix contains 13 different definitions of different variants of a reduction. Kind of overwhelming. Good reductions should have this following property. Not only do they transform problems to problems, but implicitly, the reduction can also be used to transform an answer to an answer. What this will do is if NX, this reduction will do will actually be able to transform an answer, the computation path of the machine, into a set of Boolean variables that will satisfy this thing. Now, were we to do this proof not with a non-deterministic machine, but with a deterministic verifier, what would x be then? The witness. Yeah. The witness is the that. Now, like, the hardness of SAT is what again? You're given the formula. You want to find the satisfying assignment. That's the search version of SAT. Like, if it's satisfiable, you can find this assignment, right? Finding that satisfying assignment is the hard part. This is sort of how high level the proof is going to work, OK? Now, why does this work, and why is this in CNF? Basically, what's going to happen is we're going to create uh, this big formula phi of n and w on input x to be the and of many small checks. So we're going to and a few things together. First off is going to be um, something called phi cell and uh, phi uh, start and phi move and uh, phi accept. Let's describe in detail what these four Boolean formula are going to do. Uh, but before we do that, <coughs> understand what we're doing here is we're creating a, a large formula. That formula will only contain, it will, will be the and of four smaller formula. 
such that the four smaller formula are simply going to check the machine, check if its input corresponds to a non-deterministic machine n, if n accepts w or not. That's sort of the, the point here. And we'll describe in detail the construction of these four subparts. I'll also mention that this part is the tedious part. This is the part that's like annoying in programming. Because imagine we have and, or, and not, and we're using and, or, not as a programming language to check the correctness that a machine accepts. Very trivial, not, excuse me, very non-trivial, very tricky. Two important things you need to know the Cook-Levin theorem. One, it is kind of messy in the details, but it's very conceptually simple. Like, we encoded a Boolean formula. In some sense, this Boolean formula simulates the machine. Now, that's kind of an insane statement because the formula doesn't move. It's just drawn on the page and it sits there. Yet it's moving a device we imagined in motion, you know, kind of surprising. The, 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 the little encoding thing is going to basically work out the same as um, when we did the proof of the PCP theorem, post-correspondence problem. We encoded the transition function of a Turing machine into a set of dominoes, such that those dominoes could only be aligned in a certain way if the machine accepted. Right? We're going to do the same thing, but with now a polynomial time bound. The second reason you need to know the Cook-Levin theorem, even if there's an insane amount of programming, is you'll only do this programming once. I think complexity theory has been formulated in such a way to put us all this programming baggage into one theorem and then call upon the theorem whenever you need it. So it makes the rest of the theory kind of more beautiful by having the Cook-Levin theorem a little bit on janitorial duty. Um, there will be, be many times uh, for the rest of this course, whatever three weeks we have left, when it'll be like, by a construction similar to the proof Cook-Levin theorem, I could probably write out a formula for that. I'm not going to, but I could probably do it. And then you, you think you do it, and then you finish the proof. You know, that's sort of how it goes. Um, so it's important to understand the details exactly once and then not really think about it too hard. Just understand the conceptual, conceptual, conceptually what's happening. Um, what we're going to do is let variables i, uh, excuse me, before we get to that, we need to do uh, the table. So if we consider we have, this is a deterministic machine, but consider we have this machine anyway. We have a 0, read a 0, write a 1, move right, read a 1, write a 0, move right. And let's say we read a blank. We're going to write that blank and move left. You know, let's say this is Q0 and this is QH. Okay? This is a Turing machine. This is a um, deterministic Turing machine. But let's just give the, the construction of what we're going to do. Let's write out the sequence of configurations of this machine on 1, 1, 1, right? So we're going to start in the initial configuration, Q0, 1, 1, 1, right? Let's say blank. We start out in Q0, 1, 1, 1, blank. And then when we do, what are we going to do? We're going to write the next configuration. I'm going to write the next configuration below it. It's going to read a 1, write a 0, and stay in Q0. So we're going to get the next configuration is going to be 0, Q0, 1, 1, blank, hash, right? The next configuration is going to be 0, 0, Q0, 1, blank. The next configuration is going to be 0, 0, 0, Q0, space, blank. And then our next transition is if you read a blank, you're going to write that blank back and move left. So it's going to be 0, 0, QH, blank. No, excuse me. 0, blank. Ash, okay. Notice that when I write the sequence of configurations like this, that only a local part of the tape changes. Only a constant amount of the tape changes from row to row. I'm going to outline these only because the machine is moving right in these steps. Okay. You can see that, consider every 2 by 3 window, every 2 by 3 subtable of this table. Every 2 by 3 subtable of the table is the only part that really changes near the, near the tape head. Right? The rest of it is the same. So basically what our formula is going to do, our formula is going to just loop over this table and then just check it's correct. The input variables are going to be encoded into this table. And the formula, all it's going to do, it's not going to be required to compute the machine. It's simply going to grade the machine. It's going to check if the computation is correct. It's not going to actually find the computation. Someone else is going to do that for it. But the formula exists and is satisfiable if and only if the machine accepts. 
the formula is simply going to check it accepts, right? Question so far? You might have an, like you don't know a priori how many, like how long this table is. Ah, do you not? You know that the table is of, you know that the table is polynomial sized. Actually, what is the height of this table? Don't say five. Were you going to say five? Yes. Oh, it's not five. It, consider, sorry, consider, a general, consider a generalized non-deterministic Turing machine. This is a deterministic one. Consider a generalized non-deterministic Turing machine. What should the depth of the table if you do? If you constructed its configurations in this way. The number of steps that it takes. The depth of the table is the time. If this is a time machine, this is going to take... We'll call it n to the t, OK? It has n to the t height. Um, now, what is the width of this machine? At most, n to the t. Yes. Not going further. But you, then you don't know a priori what t is. That's OK. Just redo it for each. Try it again. Oh, really? Yeah, that's OK. okay. That's lame. A little bit. Then this, that's uh, a fair characterization of the details in this theorem. I see. Um, but in general, what would t be? I mean, excuse me, what would the, the width of the table be? It is upper bounded by n to the t, but it it's, could be less. Probably around n ish. Yeah, but um, a more scientific answer. It's going to be the space used. So, like, the it's bounded by n to the t simply because a machine that uses n to the t time can use no more than n to the t new cells of the tape. So the, the space bound is the uh, width of the machine. If the machine takes only log space or something, it, what if it takes exactly quadratic space? Then the width is going to be n to the t squared, whatever, right? So we'll call this n to the s. Now notice that n to the s, we'll call it n to the s plus 2. Notice that n to the s is definitely less than n to the t because it is. But that's fine. The table is still polynomial. Sized, right? So let's create the four. Let's def, let's first define what the four formula are going to do. Now this is called a tableau or a table. That's French for table, right? So it's a tableau, and what we're going to do is just write a formula to check that the that the table exists. Okay? Um, we're going to create a set of variables i, j, x uh, uh, to to be such that this variable is one uh, if and only if the cell ij of the table uh, contains the symbol s. Okay? s is the symbol hashtag or something, right? Or it's this blank, or it's q0 or something. And s comes from some set c, where c is equal to what? q union gamma union this hash, right? It's just some symbol. We want to ensure these four checks are all we need to ensure that the table exists and is correct. Phi cell is going to be 1 if and only if um, exactly uh, one symbol is in each cell. Uh, phi start will be 1 if and only if uh, the start row is initial configuration of n on w. Phi move is, this is a kind of a hard one to define, but it's sort of like an induction step, while phi start is like the base case. Phi move is an induction hypothesis sort of step. Um, if rho i is configuration uh, ci, uh, then rho uh, i plus 1 is configuration c i plus 1 such that uh, c i yields c i plus 1, right? So if the ith row is a configuration of the machine, the ith plus 1 row will be the next configuration. That's like the induction kind of step, right? Kind of like a finite induction, right? If, if the first row is correct and 
the first row implies the second row is correct, then all the rows are going to end up being correct. Right? We need one more formula. And we'll ex expand on, these, on the construction of these formulas in just a second. We need one more formula. Phi except is basically going to be 1 if and only if uh, and accepts w. Not only just that the machine comp computes on w, but it must accept w. Right? Questions on the definitions of these four pieces? Right? We're going to just get into the Boolean logic in just a second, but this is the point of it. Right? I'll also tell you, like, many people don't, many books don't prove the Cook-Levin theorem, I think, good enough. They like, kind of expand upon how you can write the correctness of the machine as an and of, of a few checks. Cook's original paper, I looked it up, I think it had eight checks. Something like the machine moves exactly one cell at a time, something like this. A really ugly, ugly proof. But we're going to write a Boolean formula for all those four Boolean formula. And then our large phi is going to be the and of all those. Right? Questions on that? First, you should convince yourself that n accepts w if and only if exactly those four steps are satisfied. Nothing is insufficient there. Right? We have everything in exactly and only what we need. Right? Why do we need to check that like, each cell only has one symbol? Um, the table exists only if we say it does. So we need to ensure that the table is as we draw it on the board. Consider that uh, you could put, you could have a set, the variables are themselves ones or zeros, but how do they encode the table, right? This is just enforcing a data structure on it in some sense. Suppose you had x11 equal x11a is one and x11b is also one. That would mean that a and b are the same, are two symbols in the same cell. It doesn't enforce the configuration tally, right? That step is, is, is kind of a pedantic one. It just ensures the table exists. Okay, here's most, I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do the first, second, and fourth one, and then we'll leave phi move to be uh, at the end. You may believe, you may convince yourself that phi move is going to be the hard one. Phi cell is actually quite easy, right? We want to ensure exactly one cell is on for each row of the table. One symbol is on for each cell, and exactly one. So what that's going to look like is we're simply going to, if you were to describe this as an algorithm before you convert this to a Boolean formula, is you would loop over the table and just check exactly one of those variables is on. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop over the table for i, 1 less than equal to i, less than equal to n to the t, 1 less than equal to j, less than equal to n to the s. What we're going to do is ensure that, um, uh, let's say, we or over s is an element of c, where c, again, is equal to Q union gamma union union is hashtag. It's any symbols. We'll ensure that uh, X, I, J, S is on. What does this subclause do? What does this, if, if phi is satisfiable, what does this enforce, this first part? There is at least something in the cell. Yeah, at least one symbol is on. If you order them all together, satisfiable, at least one of them has to be on. They all can't be off. So at least one symbol is in the cell. Now, the formula to, to make sure that no two are on, you could probably reconstruct this. I'll just give it to you. Uh, S, T are in C, and S does not equal T. Um, X, I, J, S, not, or X, I, J, T, not. This ensures at least one, and this ensures at most one, right? No two can be on, right? Believe me, if you could rewrite this and expand this into a nice natural Boolean formula with better notation, right? You convert this big and and that big or into the proper symbols, right? This range is polynomially. This range is uh, constant. There's only constantly many symbols. This range is constant as well. Quadratic, constant, but still the same, right? What's the size of this formula? Polynomial. Yeah. I got 
O, this is like O of n to the s plus t sized, right? It's basically a double for loop over the table. So, and then you're doing a little bit at each step, constant amount, constant size formula each step. It's going to be some large constant times n, n to the s times n to the t, so it's going to be some polynomial size, right? That's how you check phi cell. Um, what about phi start? Let's see if you guys can come up with this one. How would you ensure the first row is exactly the initial configuration of M and W? I mean, you start out, you need to verify that the first and the last things are hashtags. And then that, like, immediately followed by Q naught. And then immediately followed by all of, like, the binary representation of W. And then immediately followed by blanks. What you're going to do is you're going to just hard code the first initial configuration in there. X1, comma, 3, comma, W1. And, and x1 comma, give me a second, n plus 2 comma wn, right? So this ensures that it's hashtag q0 w1 to wn. Then it ensures that you have a, you have a sufficient amount of blanks, polynomially many, 1 comma n plus 3 uh, comma blank. And, and, one comma, I got uh, one comma, n to the s plus one, comma blank, and x to the one comma, n to the s plus two, comma hashtag, right? Something like that. Just hard code the first row. Base case done. Um, what's the size of this formula? Yeah. So any algorithm to write down this formula is going to take like n to the s time. It's going to give it a description of the machine, give it a description of the word. It's going to write that down in n to the s time. OK? Actually, I can just do phi except here, because it's pretty simple. What's the formula for phi except? When does a machine accept if we have this table? What is true? What is the syntactic property of the table that is true if the machine accepts? One of the states is the accept state. Yeah. Now, depending on how you formalize this machine, you could say, first I modify the machine so it cleans up after itself before, and then the accepting configuration is unique. I could say uh, that after it accepts, it's allowed to do some more moving. Let's suppose that after it accepts, it doesn't allow, it's not allowed to move anymore. That's a fair assumption. But in fact, you could do it without it. So what I have then is that for one less than equal to i, less than equal to n to the s, um, x of n to the t, uh, comma i, comma q a is on, OK? Basically, this is just n to the t means it's the last row. Maybe I'll even do j here, yeah, just to make it a little simpler. So we have n to the t. We go to the last row. We're looking through the last row. If QA exists anywhere in the last row, the machine accepts, right? Great. What's the size of this formula? N to the S. Yeah, this one's also n to the S. So an algorithm can write down, given a description of the machine and given a word, it can write down this Boolean formula in polynomial time as well. Let's get to the hard part. Um, See, actually, I'm going to do, let's see if this works. I'm going to go a little bit here. Oh, that doesn't work. Um, let's try this. I'm going to do it here instead, OK? So we need to somehow create a formula that's polynomial sized that checks if uh, given that the first, some row i is a configuration, that the next row is the computed next configuration. Again, let's emphasize the fact that 
near the tape head, computation is the only thing that's changed, right? Everything else doesn't really change. It's only the stuff near the tape head. So what we can do is define what's called a legal window or an illegal window. So given a specific machine, a legal window is a two by three block that uh, is valid for the transition function of the Turing machine. So an example of a legal window may be like this. Okay, these are all legal windows. Okay, there are some illegal windows though. Let's see, uh, QI, QA, Q, QIA, QI, blank, blank, something like this. That's an illegal window, right? How many legal windows are there? I'm looking for a huge upper bound. Trivially, the number of things that can be in each window to the sixth. Finitely many. That's a big upper bound. There's finitely many legal windows. The configuration of the machine, the length, the size of the table is a function of this time and space. But we're going to check the correctness by checking, by looping over time and space, but checking constant sized objects at each one. So what's going to ha happen is our Phi move is going to look like the following. It's going to be, um, it's going to loop over the whole table. And it's going to just ensure that the window at i comma j is legal. What it's going to do is it's going to loop over the entire table check every single two by three window. So this is a two by three window, 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 and check that it's one of these hard coded legal windows. We'll describe that interior process in just a second. We'll do that in like 15 seconds. But first let's understand that if you can check, if the, convince yourself that five move does what it says it does, that if the next row if, the, if a row is a configuration, the next row is also a configuration. That is true if every two by three window is legal. If that's true, then the whole table is legal, right? The machine computes correctly. Nothing is syntactically skipped. Now, how do we actually like compute this IJ window uh, legal? What we do is like we'll encode the legal windows into a into a strings of length six. That's at a one to a six is legal, and then we'll define phi move like this. We're still going to double for loop over the whole thing. And then the, to define window at ij is legal, we'll just determine that those six items in the table are uh, one of the hard-coded legal windows. So I have that as for a1. A6 is legal uh, as um, x of i j minus 1, A1, and, and x i plus 1, uh, j plus 1, uh, A6. Okay. Believe me, you could enumerate uh, all the legal windows, convert them to the six element strings like this. You could create a hard-coded six-sized clause, not clause, excuse me, an and of a bunch of stuff. Uh, and you have created a uh, CNF, right? What's the size of this formula? What's the size of this interior part, first of all? These are, you're oring a bunch of s number of legal windows, which is constant. Constantly many legal windows. Each is six size six, so this interior part is actually constant. And then uh, you're looping over the whole table, 
But at each one, you're adding a, perhaps a large constant size of this. So this is O of n to the s plus t again, right? So we constructed the formula out of four parts, right? The formula is the cell, the start, the move, and the accept. Any questions on this? And here we're like implicitly utilizing the fact that we don't need to be any bound with respect to the size of n. Like n can be as large as we want it to be as long as it's finite. Well, you measure an algorithm the runtime as the size of the input. Yeah, like big n. Yes. No. So like, like, well, like I'm saying, like, like big. We don't. We don't care about how big big n is. Big n is constant in, with respect to w. Right. And so, it could have like many, many, many states, and we could have an exponential blow up with respect to the number of legal windows we have, because like each one would require like us verifying maybe like one state moves to another state as a special rule. Mm -hmm. We don't care because even though it might take a very long time to construct at the start, we just do it at the start of every computation and then never touch it again. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to always be a function of w here, the length of w. So what's the what's the size of our formula? It's going to be. Uh, let's prove that this is this is obviously a correct reduction. We've we've argued the correctness throughout, but let's argue the size. We had o of n to the s plus t, plus o of n to the s, plus o of n to the s plus t, plus O of n to the s, right? That's a polynomial-sized formula. So the table, the machine having a polynomial time and space bound implies that the formula is polynomial-sized. So the machine that writes down the formula also must take only polynomial time. It doesn't do anything trivial besides looping over stuff, right? So the formula is polynomial time. This is a polynomial time reduction. And we've also argued it's, it's correct. So we see that sat is NP-complete, and that we now have a genesis NP-complete problem. All of the programming is just hard-coded into this, right? Any questions on, on this? I'm going to give you guys one more thing before we take our little break. Let's see if I can do that. Did this one? Yes, OK. So change my mind. Okay, so um, like of the textbooks I've read on this, most don't do a sufficient proof of the Cook-Levin theorem. The Sipser book, this is the proof from the Sipser book. It does a pretty good job. I want to show you an example proof from an algorithms book of the Cook-Levin theorem. The Cook-Levin theorem um, basically is like, everyone's like, yeah, you could just probably do the and of many checks, and then you just check the machine is correct, and then it, whatever, I don't care to finish the proof. You know, so this is a book from the CLRS book on this is a proof from the CLRS book on algorithms. They don't define the Turing machine, but they do define a um, like this. I, they do a whole chapter on NP-completeness, right? And this is how they prove the Cook-Levin theorem. They don't prove uh, SAT is NP-complete. They prove circuit SAT. So given a Boolean formula with n input wires and one output wire, and or not gates, is the Boolean formula uh, satisfiable or not? Here's the way they do it, is they align it like a, perhaps a real machine, like an x86 machine, and you have a state of the machine. And a Turing machine, that would be a configuration, you know, Q0, W1 to WN, whatever. Here, it's, you know, you have a set of registers, you have your RAM, you have your storage, whatever. And they construct this circuit M. They don't actually construct it, they just describe how you would construct it, such that it takes as input, in its input wires, the configuration of, of one machine, of a machine, and it'll output the next configuration of the machine, okay? Then they say, well, the machine uses polynomial space, and then it uses polynomial time. So this whole thing is one huge circuit, and this is a polynomial size circuit. And there's your one little output bit, right? So circuit sat is NP-complete, QED. Convert the deterministic verifier into a polynomial size circuit, and with time by space, you get a polynomial size circuit, QED. You know. Sort of basically what we did, but we worked through the details. Now, how this circuit M is constructed, I'll leave it to you to figure out using and, or, and not gates. I believe, you, I believe that you could believe it's possible somehow to do that. Right? Any questions? Awesome.